from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The word of life. Have you ever had the experience where you were really looking forward to something or been planning a party or looking forward to a big event and then something comes up or you have to go someplace else at the last minute and you miss the whole thing? That's sort of what happened to Thomas. Jesus comes back, risen from the dead, to appear to the disciple band and Thomas is gone. The text does not tell us where Thomas went, but he's gone to run an errand or something, and he misses the whole event. Now, this story actually starts back up in verse 19. It says, When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. And then it tells us that he bids them peace once and then twice. Then he offers them the power of the Holy Spirit. And he sends them into the world to serve in his name, to proclaim the gospel, the good news of the gospel. And Thomas misses it all. And then Thomas returns, and he refuses to believe them. They say to him, we have seen the Lord. And in his brashness, he says, I'm not going to believe unless I see it myself, unless I can touch him myself. And he doesn't believe these other disciples with whom he's been traveling and living and working for some time. I find it interesting that the Gospel of John is the only one that tells this story about Thomas. And it's also the only one that tells us a story about Thursday night that includes a conversation between Jesus and Thomas. You can find it back in your Bible in chapter 14 of John. Jesus has washed their feet and said to them that he set them an example. That all happens in chapter 13. And in the beginning of 14, Jesus is speaking, says these words, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus is telling them about what's about to happen, trying to prepare them for all of this. And Thomas interrupts. Jesus is saying, I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come back and get you. I'm going to take you. He's coming back for them. Thomas interrupts with his protest just as Jesus is laying out the plan. It's kind of interesting to me that Thomas interrupts when Jesus is telling what's going to happen, and then when it happens, Thomas misses it. As I was looking at the response of the disciples, it seems to me that some are really listening. 
Some, no doubt, are questioning and wondering, but some are protesting. I think there's an insight for us here in our time, and it helps us remember that people react in very different ways when they encounter Jesus or other Christians. Of course, we can see this in the multiplicity of denominations we have within the Christian family. If we took time this morning and went around the sanctuary, we wouldn't all have the same story. Some of us would say, oh, I was raised Methodist and I've always been a Methodist. But some others would say, oh, no, I started out as Roman Catholic or I was Southern Baptist or I was Nazarene or I didn't have any Christian upbringing. We would have a variety of stories about how we have come to faith and how we happen to be here today. And our experiences would vary widely as we told those stories. As I was thinking about that this week, reading over this text, it made me think of my two grandfathers. They were both Methodist. But they're a great illustration in terms of a variety of experience. My paternal grandfather grew up in town. His father was largely absent from his home. His mother was the dominant figure in his life, and she was a devout Methodist. They lived within walking distance of their local Methodist church. They were there every Sunday and often several days in between. He loved the Methodist church. When he grew up and married and moved away from that town, For his career, he found the local Methodist church in that place, and he began to attend, and he was there every week. And in his lifetime, he served about every role you could serve in a Methodist church, from being the custodian to being an usher to being an offering bearer to being on this board and that board. He was treasurer of the church at one time. He loved the church and largely lived his life out through his local Methodist church. Now, he was willing to serve others in need and often did so, but his life and his expression of faith was largely expressed through that local church that he was a part of. My maternal grandfather grew up on an oil lease outside of town, out in the country. Now, this was the early 1900s. There were no automobiles. They did not have a car. There was no church close, and so he did not grow up going to church. But as he was growing up, one summer he went to live with his Aunt Annie. His Aunt Annie was a devout Methodist. At her house, things were very different than what he had grown up with. Nothing else went on except faith on Sunday. Sunday morning was occupied with going to Sunday school and church. But even when you came home, there was to be no other reading, no other discussions except for Bible reading and faith discussion. My grandfather loved to play cards, but not at Aunt Annie's. No card playing, especially on Sunday afternoon. That was frivolity. No board games, no fun. You were to focus on faith and faith alone. By the time he became an adult, he decided that was a little too strict for him. But every time we had a conversation about faith when I was growing up, he would tell me about the summer he spent with his Aunt Annie and how they had studied Scripture and he had learned the Bible stories and memorized this and memorized that. He very seldom actually attended worship at a Methodist church. Oh, he would go for the sort of the high holy days or there was a baptism or a wedding, but he was not an every Sunday churchgoer. But as I think about his life, one of the things I noticed is that when I was growing up, all the people I met who were not white were because they were friends of my maternal grandfather. He was of German ancestry, but he had a a broad and an uncommon circle of friends and relationships. People I came to know because they were in our home. They would come to visit when he would come to visit. Now, my grandfathers were both Methodist, as I said, but you can see that they lived out their faith in very different ways. They both embodied, I think, love your neighbor as yourself. 
They both loved and provided for their families, cared about their communities, worked hard, made contributions to their communities. And yet the way they expressed their faith, the way in which they practiced their faith, took different forms. Another story I think applies here that I read this week was about an American soldier serving in one of the invasions in the South Pacific in World War II. It was a first-hand account of a soldier who had been on a ship going in to invade an island. He said, we were moving right in at good speed, and then all of a sudden our boat came to a grinding halt. We had hit a coral reef, and we were snagged, and we were taking on water. And the commander ordered everyone off the boat. He acted quickly, he said, and jumped into the water, but the water was deeper than he had anticipated. And he'd acted so quickly that he had not taken off his pack or his rifle or his canteen or his boots. He said he began to sink and sink fast. He struggled as hard as he could to get back up to the surface of the water and gasp for air and then down again. He said he tried to figure out how to get off some of the weight, but by then everything was wet and nothing he could do could get any of the weight off. He said he felt exhausted in a matter of seconds. He said after he bobbed a couple of times, he thought, this is over. I'm not going to make it. He said he struggled back to the surface to gasp one more time, and he noticed another soldier struggling right there next to him. And he said without thought for the other fellow's welfare, he just grabbed a hold of him and pulled this guy toward him to keep himself above the water. He said they flailed around for a few minutes and finally found a portion of the reef where they could stand and sit and be above the water. And he said we stayed there until a boat came and rescued us. But he says that he felt so guilty about grabbing his fellow soldier without any thought of the welfare of the other, that he never spoke of the incident. Then he said, months later, we were back stateside. And one day, he said, I walked into a restaurant, and I saw the other fellow sitting across the restaurant. He said, immediately upon seeing me, he stood up and waved me over. And so I walked over there. And when I got to the table, he said to the friends whom he was eating with, this is the fellow I was telling you about that saved my life. And the guy thought, what? And he began to protest, and he said, oh, no, don't you remember? We were in the invasion together. We all had to jump in the water. I was just about to drown. I was taking my last breath when you came along and grabbed me and held me up. Same place, same time, very different perspectives on what happened. We all have unique perspective in terms of how we make meaning of the experiences of our lives. And we so easily can misunderstand or misinterpret the actions and the behaviors and the choices of others when we don't understand the background or how they were thinking. When I thought about my grandfathers, I thought they are good examples that remind us that people come to faith under different circumstances and express their faith in a variety of ways. We don't always understand another person's background we do not always know the experiences they have had that have led them to a certain conclusion or a certain place of life and those of us who make choices to come to church every sunday at least i will confess find it easily to judge those who don't make the same choice sometimes to judge others quickly and harshly is a mistake on our part. Too often, I think, as Christians, we slip into this idea that we can disregard or devalue those who don't believe as we believe or practice faith as we practice it. But as I was reading through this passage this week, 
thinking about all of this, thinking about how does God deal with all the variety of experiences, all the different ways that people respond. It caused me to think of that passage in the Bible. It's in a, in a different context, but the Bible uses the idiom 70 times 7 for how many chances we have at forgiveness. It means more than we imagine. 70 times 7 means more than we think. I think the same applies to how many chances God gives us to come to faith, to work on our discipleship, to focus on who God wants us to be. Back in our story, I think it's easy for us to judge Thomas harshly for being so brazen and so blatant in his response to Jesus, to miss when Jesus returns, in fact. But what the story points out to us is that Jesus comes back. Even though Thomas has interrupted and misunderstood and missed the event, Jesus does not give up on him. The Gospel of John tells us Jesus comes back to help Thomas come to faith. And when he comes back, he says, Look, see the wounds. Thomas says, my God and my Lord, my Lord and my God. Now, did Thomas just come to faith, or was he a man of faith before? Oh, I think he was a man of faith before, but now he understands it at a deeper level. This return of the risen Christ impacts him for sure. The good news here for all of us is that God gives us multiple chances. That God works with us individually and personally based on our experience and our choices and our responses. The gospel is not one size fits all or one and done or three strikes and you're out. None of that in the gospels. The gospels proclaim that God keeps coming to us. That through the risen Christ, God will continue to come to us. You can see it and hear it in this very last part of what we were reading today. Verse 29 was the last verse we read. Jesus has come back as the risen Christ. The story is very similar to what had happened the week before, but this time John says Thomas was there. Jesus says, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas responds, my Lord and my God. And then in verse 29, Jesus says to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Can you hear it? The blessings are for those who see and believe. But the blessings are also for those who have not seen and believe anyway. As we've been working through these stories of the risen Christ, we've seen this first at the tomb, and then on the path out of the garden, then on the road to Emmaus, today in the upper room. The story next week will be at the seashore. All of them, God coming to people through the risen Christ and blessing them and sending them out to share the blessing with others. The blessings of God come in all sorts of ways and in all different kinds of places. God is at work all around us, and sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we understand it, but sometimes we do not. And certainly our responses vary, even within our own lives from time to time. We may respond differently to how God is coming to us in Christ. It's so interesting how some people come to faith as children. Others don't come until well in adulthood. Some come to faith through their family circle. Others come through someone they've barely met. Some people find the most meaning in faith when they're inside the church building and serving and worshiping and studying here. Others find it outside the walls of the church. We have such a variety 
of experiences. Surely it is a sign of growth when we can celebrate the breadth and variety of God's work. And the Gospel of John says, it's important to recognize that because it's all toward the same end. Just two verses beyond where we finished reading in verse 31, the author of the Gospel of John says, all this is written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in His name. Amen, and thanks be to God.